Back in April, one of my Facebook friends messaged me that one of my paintings was going to get auctioned off. Tough Guys was estimated to be between $1 and $200, but when I checked, the highest bid was only $60. A blank stretched canvas from an art supply store costs way more than that. I shudder to think that an impoverished art student would be smart just to buy Tough Guys to paint over. Yikes, I messaged back. Time has not been kind to my artistic reputation. And in fact, before I switched in 2007 from making art to making movies about my fellow artists, I did have a reputation, albeit a tiny one. I entered the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in 1976, keen on learning how to paint realistically, but having no clue about how to do it. I worked hard, listened to the excellent faculty, and especially to my classmate, Edgar Jarens, and learned a lot. I won a prize for best nude painting done in the school studios, and this painting of my then girlfriend, now wife, Nancy, won the portrait prize. Sorry, Nancy, I know you hate the word wife. After graduating in 1980, I continued to paint straight realism for a while. My work became less traditional when I began to paint still lifes with brightly colored plastic objects and patterns. One day, on a whim, I decided to break up the space that these objects existed in, and this was the beginning of my Cubist series, the paintings that gave me the tiny reputation that I mentioned earlier. These still lifes got me a solo show at the Delaware Art Museum and inclusion in the juried Contemporary Philadelphia Art Now show at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. The central theme in my movies is how the work and life of an artist intersect. And in December of 1993, life slammed violently into Nancy and me. We were walking back to our car after a party when we were set upon by three young men. The oldest held me at gunpoint, and when I told him I didn't have my wallet, he tried to get me to walk down a deserted alley with him. Terrified to the point of dissociation, I managed to recover my wits just enough to stay put, which may have saved my life. Nancy gave the other two her purse, and the three of them took off, but we were both very shaken up. The robbery had an immediate effect on my art, I ended the Cubist series and began what I called my crime paintings. It was an attempt to deal with the shame and powerlessness I felt. I used friends, students, and myself as models. I'd play the part of the victim or the perpetrator and often both in the same painting. Some of these reflect sexual or racial anxiety. None of the characters in my crime paintings are heroic. Those who aren't violent are often cowardly, pathetic, and self-pitying. I was inspired by the Northern European paintings of Christ as a skinny weakling, as opposed to the He-Man Jesus that later Baroque painters would render. I thought a lot about playwright Tom Stoppard's take on Hamlet. 
He didn't focus on the larger-than-life Prince of Denmark, but on two nebishes, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, who lacked all agency. Stoppard's irony and dark humor is what I wanted to put into these paintings. I had shows of these at Roger LaPelle's gallery in Philadelphia and sold a fair number. But by the time I switched to filmmaking, I had a bunch that I hadn't shown. An art critic for New Yorker once wrote, there must be thousands of paintings stacked up in artist studios, radiating a half-life of blighted ambition. In my studio, 23 crime paintings are stacked up. Although I'm happy to report that they stopped glowing in the dark the night Tough Guys was auctioned. Oh, excuse me, somebody said our, our front door. Oh my goodness, John, is that a movie store? Even better, it's an auctioneer. Hello, Kyle. Good morning, it's a beautiful Monday. <laughs> Hello, Nancy, how are you? Nancy. My name's Kyle Oak. I own an auction and appraisal company in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Um, I've been working in the auction industry for about seven years um, in a variety of capacities. I worked at an auction company in Philadelphia called Freeman's for some time, and I also studied at Sotheby's, a major international auction house in New York. I founded my company in 2021. Our first sale was December 2022, and um, the reaction's been very positive. Kyle, you told me that Tough Guys was part of the Roger LaPelle estate sale and that the auction itself took place over a number of days. I was frankly shocked at how it unfolded. Your painting took off at auction. It was the most viewed work in the sale, also the most favorited. For those who don't know, the auction industry has moved mainly online over the course of the last five to 10 years. That was particularly accelerated by COVID. Tough Guys was sold at the end of the sale. So There's quite a bit of buildup. Purchaser of the painting is a pretty serious collector who collects at New York galleries. Kyle, can you explain what a reserve is? Sure, so a reserve is the minimum that an item can sell for at auction. That could either be the starting bid of an item or it could be a hidden reserve. So if you're worried it's going to be sold as a cheap pre-prime canvas, you can put a reserve on it? They can, but it doesn't necessarily make sense in all cases to do so. I think for an artist who's just entering the auction market for the first time, it does make sense to protect the work at auction. What would you say to the vast majority of living artists who, like me, are not famous? It's highly unlikely that a significant number of people would know about you outside of the gallery that has represented you or the connections that you've made over the years. So when your work is being placed at auction, you're trying to get someone who's interested in art but doesn't know who you are to part ways with their money in the situation where they have a lot of options. I guess a living artist needs to consider that if they don't have an established auction record, then their art is going to sell on its merits. The artist won't have an opportunity to sell themselves to the potential buyer. There's not a wine and cheese gallery opening where you might show up and make connections with collectors, supporters of your practice. I talked to a collector once at an opening, and he really liked a painting by someone who's not that well known, and he said that it reminded him of Edward Hopper. It's much more likely that they're going to buy or bid on a work that looks like something that a famous artist has made that they can relate to or that they feel comfortable with. I don't know if he realizes it, but this 29-year-old auctioneer with the movie star looks has the soul of a great Stoic philosopher. Epictetus teaches us that we must be concerned only with the things that are within our power. Artists cannot control their reputations 
or whether the artworks they so painstakingly crafted end up in museums or painted over by art students. They cannot control their collectors, who are sometimes shallow and more interested in impressing people with their big-name art than really engaging with it aesthetically. But they can control certain things. What would you say to artists whose work goes for very low price and why they shouldn't simply quit painting or kill themselves? Um, I don't think that artists whose work sells for a low price uh, should feel particularly upset. There have been countless cases of artists who were underappreciated during their time whose work ended up becoming incredibly sought after. I would encourage an artist to focus on the quality of your work and what it is that you're trying to communicate. Kyle's advice is undeniably true. And yet, in honor of all the nebishes I've painted over the years, I cannot end this movie on such a high note. Kyle, I know the auction was online, but could you reenact it as if it were one of the old fashioned kind? Uh, 200, 200, look at three, 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 four. I have 45, four, five, four, five. Have blah, 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 blah. Tough guy sold. For? $6,500. Oh, and Kyle forgot the 25% buyer's premium. Uh, who am I fooling? That's a horrible way to end a movie. Nobody likes a humble brag. So maybe I'll close with a little sobering honesty. Marcus Aurelius wrote, Time is like a river made up of the events which happen, and it's a violent stream for as soon as a thing has been seen, it is carried away, and another comes in its place, and this will be carried away also. I painted this still life in 1987. It won a prize at the Woodmere Art Museum's annual juried show and ended up in their collection. It became the museum's most popular painting with young people, and Woodmere's education director hired me to come on a regular basis to talk to visiting school children about my painting and art in general. Not long ago, a friend told me that Woodmere had deaccessioned my still life. Woodmere sent it and other disfavored works to an auction house. What really bothers me is that they did not notify me, so I had no chance to try to buy my painting back. It sold for $75. What to make then of an obscure artist and two auctions of his work? In the art world as in life, Nothing lasts. What was down goes up and may well go down again. Truly, all an artist can control is the love and labor that they put into their work and the joy that process brings. I end this movie, though, with a plea to any museum director who might see it. It may be uncomfortable for you, but let living artists and donors know when you deaccession their works and the time and place of the sale. That's the right thing to do. My fellow artists, here's a depressing but oddly consoling fact. You might think that a museum buying your work is great news, but unless you are super famous, your piece is likely just entered an art cemetery. So whether your cheaply auctioned picture is painted over by an art student or buried in a museum vault, 
the result is much the same. No one will ever see your picture in person again. So call me about a video.